Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to look at optimization problems. Now what this means is we're going to be presented with a problem, usually stated verbally or in the form of a word problem, and our goal is to try to find the best or the optimal solution to the problem given the criteria that the problem describes. So let's go ahead and look at the first example. So we want to find the dimensions of the right circular cylinder with the greatest volume that can be inscribed in a right circular cone of radius 8 and of height 12. So here's our picture. We've got the cone in red, and then we've got our right circular cylinder drawn inside in blue. Our goal is to find the cylinder of greatest volume. So there are a number of choices for cylinders that can sit inside this cone. Now there can be really short cylinders that are nice and wide and have a large base radius which sit inside the cone. There can be really tall narrow ones that sit inside the cone. And our goal for all of these different kinds of cylinders that can sit inside the cone in this way, our goal is to find the cylinder that has the greatest volume. So, how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to come up with a function describing the volume of the cone in terms of some parameter. And that parameter we're going to allow to vary so that we sweep out over all the different kinds of cylinders that can sit inside of it. And then we're going to look at finding the maximum value for that volume function. So let's go ahead and see how we can do this. So the first thing we want to do is try to describe all of these different cylinders that sit inside the cone in terms of one variable, one parameter. And the one I'm going to use is if we notice that all my cylinders that I've drawn in the diagram here, they differ in terms of their radius, the radius of their circular cross section. So there's a radius of that inner one's right here, then there's the radius of the one that was already drawn in the diagram here. And then, of course, we have our radius of our big one, which is here. So the radius is my parameter that I'm going to use to choose to differentiate between all of these different cylinders. So I'm going to reduce my diagram down to just a two-dimensional cross-section, the picture. And I really only need to consider half the diagram because of the symmetry involved here. Uh, these cylinders and the cone in general has this mirror symmetry across this vertical plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw half of the cone and I'm going to project it down into two dimensions. So there's my cone, or at least half the cone projected in two dimensions. My cylinder, which sits inside of it, well at least half of it, you know, this sort of cutting it with this plane here, my cylinder sits something like this, or half the cylinder sits like that. So this will be the radius of my cylinder, and this is the base radius of the cone. We've got the height of the cone, which is 12, and then we've got the height of our cylinder. So let's name some quantities. We'll let x be the radius of the cylinder. And so that's in our diagram there. And we'll let y be the height of the cylinder. So there's y. And finally we'll let v be the volume of the cylinder. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to come up with a description of our volume. What is our volume in terms of x? Okay, so in order to do that, well, the first thing we can notice is that the volume in, expressed in terms of x and y, well, remember that what this x represents is this red segment in our diagram. It's that base radius of our cylinder, draw in red there just to draw the connection with our diagram over here. 
So what is our volume going to be? Well, our volume of a cylinder is the area of the base times the height. So the area of the cross-sectional circle times the height of the cylinder. So it's going to be pi times the base radius squared times the height. I'd like this volume expressed in terms of just one variable, expressed in terms of x alone. This diagram here is going to allow me to make a connection between x and y. What do I have? Well, I have a set of similar triangles here. I have this green triangle is similar to the larger triangle that it sits inside. So what are the dimensions on this green triangle? Well, it still has height y. What's the base? Well, it's going to be the difference of 8 and x. So this is 8 minus x. That's that distance there. So what we have is by similar triangles, We have the height of the big triangle, 12, divided by the base of the big triangle, 8, is equal to the height of my smaller triangle, y, over the base of my smaller triangle, 8 minus x. So there's our relationship between x and y. Notice that 12 eighths can reduce down to 3 halves. So this is 3 halves is equal to y over 8 minus x. Or in other words, y is equal to multiplying both sides of the equality by 8 minus x, we get 3 halves 8 minus x. Or, in other words, y is equal to 3 halves of 8, that's 12 minus 3 halves x. So there's our relationship between x and y. y is actually 12 minus 3 halves x. And this is great news because now we've got our volume function expressed entirely in terms of x alone. This is pi times x squared times 12 minus 3 halves x. Okay, so what do we want to do now? We've got our volume function in x. Changing the value of x is essentially like changing or sweeping through all of these different cylinders. We want to find the one of maximum volume or greatest volume. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to optimize this function. We'd like to find the maximum value of v. But we don't want to find the maximum value of v for all x values, for all real numbers x. We want to find the maximum value of v over a particular interval, the valid x values for which we can construct these cylinders. So we want to optimize and in particular, maximize, or find the maximum value of v for x in what interval? Where do we want the x values to go over? Well, the x value is the base radius. So this should be a positive number. So x ranges from 0 out to what? What's the biggest? radius of a cylinder that we can get inscribed inside this cone. Well, the biggest radius would be 8, because that's the base radius of the cone. So x has to range from 0 to 8. So what we want to do is we want to maximize v on this interval. We've now set up the problem. This is, in some sense, considered a pre-calculus part, the pre-calculus part of the problem. We haven't done any calculus yet. We've come up with the function that we want to maximize and the interval that we want to maximize it over. Now we go into calculus mode. How do we do this? So we maximize by, well, we need to find the critical points. This is a closed interval, so we're going to find the critical points. Those are potential candidates for maximum occur. We're going to look at the endpoints. We're going to compare all values. This was the closed interval method. So we compute the derivative, v prime of x. What's our derivative? Well, in order to do the derivative, maybe I'll expand this out so I don't have to use the product rule. So I'll do 12x squared minus 3 halves x cubed. Now when I take the derivative, it's still pi times the derivative of this polynomial, which is 24x minus 9 halves x squared. We're going to want to set this equal to 0 and find the critical numbers. So in order to do that, let's factor it first. So that's 24 
minus 9 halves x. We're going to set it equal to 0. And what does that tell us? That tells us that x is equal to 0. Where else? Well, also the value of x which makes this factor, 24 minus 9 halves x, equal to 0. So that would be, what, 48 ninths. And 48 ninths, that simplifies down to, there's 3 is a factor of both of them, so that's 16 thirds. So there are our two critical numbers. So now we compare. What is the volume at 0, the one end point, which happens to be a critical number? What is the volume at our critical point, 16 thirds, which is right in between 0 and 8? It's in that interval. 16 thirds is a little bit bigger than 5. And what is our value at 8? Now at 0 and 8, should be able to see right away what the value of the volume is, you know, either by the picture or by throwing it into the function. By looking at the picture, when our base radius is 0, it means we've just got a straight line connecting the bottom of the cone to the vertex of the cone. That has 0 volume. You can also see that by plugging 0 into our volume formula up here. And when our base radius is 8, that means our cylinder is just a well, essentially a flat pancake right at the bottom of the cone. It's got no height, so it's also going to have a volume of zero. So it seems likely that our maximum volume occurs at this other critical number. And so we can plug that in, and we get that it's pi times 16 thirds, all squared, times 12 minus 3 halves, 16 thirds, and let's do a bit of simplification here. So we've got pi 16 thirds, so 16 squared. Well, I'm going to write that as a power of 2, so that's 16 is 2 to the 4th. If you square that, that's 2 to the 8th. So that's 2 to the 8th. And then 3 squared is 9. And that's multiplied by 12 minus 3 halves, 16 thirds. So the 3's would cancel. The 2 goes into the 16, leaves 8. 12 minus 8 is 4. Oh, so that's multiplied by 4 here, which means I can write this as pi times 2 to the 10 over 9. Or in other words, pi times 1,024 over 9. And that's bigger than 0. So we've found the critical numbers. We've evaluated the function at the critical numbers and the endpoints. We see which one's the biggest. This is the closed interval method for maximizing a function. We see it's biggest at the critical number. And so we've now got our conclusion. We've got that the cylinder of greatest volume which can be inscribed in the cone has volume pi times 1024 over 9 and radius what's our radius? Our radius was 16 by 3 and height what's our height? Well our height was our y value, so that was 12 minus 3 halves of x, which was 16 by 3. And you can see we've essentially already done that calculation. It was embedded in our calculation above. It's this, and so our height was 4. And height 4. So there's our dimensions. So that's our concluding statement. And it's in, it is important in these problems to write your concluding statement, which addresses the question that was being asked. We're asked to find the dimensions of the right circular cylinder with greatest volume. So our concluding statement should be to that effect. We found the uh, cylinder of greatest volume. We've indicated its volume here. We've also indicated what its dimensions are for a cylinder. That means including its radius and its height. Now I indicated as we were working on this problem that 
the first little bit, working out this volume function and figuring out what to optimize. So all the way up to here. This was our pre-calculus part. This is pre-calc. And then below that line, this is now calculus. So our pre-calculus was the setup of the problem. Finding what we call the objective function. This was the volume function. The function that is the object of our consideration. The interval we want to optimize it on, and whether we want to find the max or a min. All of that was a part of the setup. Once we've got that set up, once we've got that objective function, we then go into calculus mode and do our optimization techniques uh, for finding maximum and minimum, looking at critical numbers, comparing with endpoints, maybe doing first derivative tests, any of these things that we've learned to find maximum and minimum. That's the calculus mode. Now, while you're working on your homework problems and learning how to solve these optimization problems, you'll find that oftentimes the trickiest part is getting that function set up. Once you get that function set up, the calculus is then sort of mechanical. Right? It's, it's use our optimization techniques, find critical numbers, compare at the endpoints, and do those things I've just said a couple of times already. Uh, that's the mechanical part. Go ahead and work on those by hand. Make sure you can do them by hand. But know that you can also double check your work using tools like Wolfram Alpha. So for this particular example, I could go to Wolfram Alpha. And once I've got my objective function, which I've typed in here, and I've got my interval on which I want to optimize it on, I can just fire it into Wolfram Alpha and say maximize this function for the variable in this interval and it will come back and it will tell me what the maximum value is and it will also tell me where it occurred. So you can use this. You can use this tool to double check your work. If you think you've got the wrong answer or you know you've got the wrong answer and you want to figure out whether it was your objective function that was the issue or whether it was your calculations that were the issue, well take your objective function, fire into Wolfram Alpha, see if it comes back with the answer you expect and then try to figure out where you went wrong from there. All right, so that's it for this example. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a few more examples now.